Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have Dragan here today. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Dragan Kuderer is professor of physics at the University of Michigan since 2007. He got his PhD at the University of Chicago. Then he was postdoc at Case Western Reserve University and then NSF fellow at the University of Chicago. Dragon works on dark energy, large scale structure, and testing fundamental physics with observations. Today, he will present evidence for suppression of uh, growth in the standard cosmological model. Dragon, please, you can start when you're ready. Thank you, Eleonora. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, good to see some people. Um, I am going to talk about uh, a paper from last year. I would have talked about DESI, uh, in which I've been uh, quite deeply involved recently, but Mustafa Ishak Bushaki is giving a DESI talk in Cosmoverse next week, I believe. So he will talk about that. Uh, and you can see I have a DESI image here on the front page. We are at the center. This is a small fraction of DESI year one galaxies. Suspiciously enough, this is the same as the front page of my cosmology textbook, also the same DESI image. Um, and uh, so that's been, to me, the most exciting development recently in cosmology. And Mustafa will talk about it next week, uh, DESI year one BAO results, and uh, there will be more results to come. Meanwhile, I will give a short talk here about, uh, based on a paper that came out last year that was led by uh, my postdoc uh, and LCTP fellow, Min Nguyen, and uh, former graduate student at this point, uh, Yu Wei Wen. Um, first, to start with some in, uh, background, uh, expansion history of the universe, starting from the Big Bang and onto the present day with epochs that are uh, radiation dominated, dark matter, and then dark energy dominated. Uh, and it is the case that it's been about 25 years since the discovery of dark energy. It's, it's been quite a long time, a quarter century now. Mm -hmm. uh, dark energy was discovered. Um, I was in graduate school at the time, and, and I and I think many of us thought that that was going to be resolved in a few years. Uh, and now it seems to be one of the main paradigms and, and great mysteries of, of, of cosmology for years to come, it seems. What's happened in dark energy generally, and I think everyone, most people here are aware of this, is that uh, the constraints have focused around, they've converged really on the value where dark energy density is about 70%, so matter density about 30% of the energy density. And then the equation of state of dark energy, this parameters was initially not very well constrained, but now the constraints have really uh, converged around W of minus one. Um, and you can see here historical 20 years ago in green, about 10 years ago in red and about today at the time of writing of this paper in blue, constraints conversion, of course, uh, DESI year one and potentially other data uh, pointing to certain departures from that that Mustafa will be talking about next week. Uh, but uh, another really exciting thing other than, you know, discovery of dark energy happened and then results just converged around these values of dark energy parameters. Uh, the other thing has been Hubble tension with, that was, uh, I think, much discussed here on these uh, talks, Cosmoverse talks, between local measurements that give a higher value of H0 and the global, uh, really all global measurements agree on, on this type of 67, 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This fairly recently plus the five sigma, sigma threshold, and it is, in my opinion, uh, pretty much the most exciting thing in cosmology because it may indicate new physics. Um, and here I'm going to, there are many, many models that attempt to explain the Hubble tension. And if you'd like to see all of those models in one place, you can check out this paper uh, led by Eleonora uh, from a few years ago. There are many, but there is only one very special, one simple model. Now it seems like a million dollar question, well, what is this one model? Why is this one special? And one of them is really, is special in that that model is just really sample variance, cosmic variance. So that model, it's not really much of a model. It's just a statement that what if global H0 is 67? But we just happen to live in a local, uh, the, you know, the place of the universe where, you know, not all places in the universe are different. Some have H0 slightly bigger than H67. Some have lower 67. And maybe we live in a, you know, in a corner of the universe where H0 is 73. Uh, and I wanted to say a few words before I talk about the PRL paper, a few words about this. Uh, this model is, in my opinion, completely ruled out, and this was based on one of the most satisfying papers I've ever worked on, this uh, paper with Heidi Wu. 
uh, as well as there was other related work uh, um, a similar time, uh, that it was very satisfying because it's a completely foolproof way to, to basically simulate this and to very, very precisely quantify the error bar coming from sample variants. So I'm going to explain that in a moment. So what we did was we took a very large n-body simulation, just a dark matter simulation with a very large volume, and then we populated that, we split it artificially into these cubes uh, and sub-volumes. Into each sub-volume, we put observer at the center. And then we actually mimic the supernova distribution from the shoes team uh, exactly with 3D coordinates of, of supernovae. So for each observer, you know where the 3D coordinates of supernovae are. In your simulation, you find the nearest dark matter halo. And then you pretend that dark matter halo is a supernova. And because it's a simulation, you know everything. You know peculiar velocity of that supernova. You, you know everything there is to know. And then you, quote unquote, measure H naught in that sub -volume. Now, there's 512 subvolumes, but each subvolume you do get a choice of rotation of where the supernovae are. So the supernova positions are fixed, but the overall uh, position, overall orientation of the coordinate system relative to the box is arbitrary. So we also do Euler angle rotations within each box. So for each of the boxes, we have 3,000 uh, uh, rotations. Uh, and for each rotation, you find the closest dark matter halo to each supernova, and you measure. You you do repeat the whole uh, analysis from Shu's team, and you measure H naught. So it's a completely straightforward thing to do. So you get a lot of statistics. You get 512 times 3,000, so more than a million realizations of uh, of this um, process. Initially, when we started this project, uh, I thought that it would be good to get constrained realizations of our universe. Constrained realizations are realizations where you have a, some kind of simulation that looks a lot like our neighborhood, has a Virgo cluster nearby, et cetera. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized that it's actually really hard to do constrained realization because the question is, what, on what conditions do you constrain? So eventually, we realized it's just better to do brute force simulate. So here we have more than a million possibilities of where you could live in the universe. And so surely we are not our position in, in the universe is not any more special than the most extreme, you know, one of those million. So we, we got so much statistics that we think we are really sampling all possibilities of what the neighborhood should be like. And after that, so you get some histogram. Each box and orientation gives you H naught, and you get a you get a whole bunch of these. You actually got deviation of H naught relative to the mean. And so um, the that's a, some you know distribution that looks like a Gaussian that I'm going to show in a moment. And the width of the distribution is 0.3 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So this is 120th of the six kilometers per second per megaparsec that we need to explain the Hubble tension. So that means we need a 20 sigma effect in sample variance in order to explain the Hubble tension. Now 20 sigma, as you know, never happens. It cannot happen. So this, in my mind, completely rules out uh, this uh, you know, local void or you know, special place Spe special place where we live as an explanation for the Hubble constant. Also, this is the simplest model for the Hubble tension. Here's another view of that. So as I said, we measure these deviations. So this is the zero is some ground truth. This is a global of, uh, so this is, you can think of this as 67, but here it's centered at zero. And then you get distribution. So the blue histogram is, uh, you can see it looks actually very Gaussian. It's the distributions of, uh, of for each subvolume, you get slightly more, slightly less. And if you just take one subvolume that's two sigma unusual uh, on the on the earring on the high side, you get the distribution. You still get the distribution of the value because remember you you have many you, you have many two sigma subvolumes. Anyway, all of that is very very far away from how far you need to get to explain the Hubble tension. And the reason intuitively why this is small is that local supernovae go out to Z of about 0 0.15, which is not such a tiny redshift. So 0 0.15 red, you know, you can convert that in megaparsecs, but it's whatever it is, it's hundreds of megaparsecs. And so that's actually a fairly decent chunk of the universe so that the sample variance is small. So to me, this reasoning uh, from this explicit analysis on simulations uh, makes me more excited about how Hubble uh, tension because the simplest explanation is ruled out that leaves crazy explanations out there. And that's, uh, that's exciting, you know, or some catastrophic um, systematic error that nobody could foresee. 
And so that raises the stakes, and that's why I think Hubble tension is uh, quite exciting. Okay, so now I'm moving on to talking about the growth suppression. But before I do that, there's also uh, sigma eight or S8 tension. I'm sure also discussed at these seminars, the S8 parameter, that's a combination of amplitude of mass fluctuation sigma eight and the matter that's the omega matter. This is the combination that lensing surveys, for example, measure very well, is higher as measured by Planck experiment. Uh, it's a measured as a derived parameter. Then by measured by lensing surveys, where it's a little bit more directly measured, this is the, the this parameter to which there's a lot of sensitivity. And I'm showing just one of the figures. Many people made uh, these results in figures, but this is the DES year three and kids 1000 combined analysis which is the purple curve. So you can see it's not very much lower. It's like 1.5 or two sigma. Uh, you know, it's much lesser uh, statistical significance of SA being discrepant than, than the Hubble tension, right? So the blue is higher in the vertical direction than the red. At, at here, it doesn't even look like it. it's less than two sigma probably in this paper. Nevertheless, this is something that uh, uh, you know, people are quite interested in and uh, has uh, some solutions have been proposed. What I'm gonna talk about next is uh, the, the bottom line is that maybe S8 is not, the, I know it's a well-measured parameter by lensing surveys in particular, but that's maybe not where the action is happening. That might not be, there may be a discrepancy, but it's not very well reflected in S8. It's better reflected in some other ways to describe cosmic growth. Um, so in terms of a forthcoming survey, this is just the top of the iceberg list. And uh, the results I'm going to show are going to get updated. Uh, these are the current survey, lensing surveys and uh, Rubin telescope in the future. And then these are just some of the best known surveys. There are many others um, and um, they are informing some of this work. But to provide a little bit more background before I show results, um, what, what motivates generally looking at cosmic growth? Now, if you, if you work in cosmology, you probably know this already at some level. Uh, but I do like this uh, kind of, um, uh, to illustrate that with the Friedman equation, the first Friedman equation. First Friedman equation here on the right-hand side says expansion rate squared is proportional to the sum of dark matter density and then maybe some dark energy density. And dark energy density is written in a funny way because you can also move this term to the left-hand side. So as with Einstein equations, everything that's on the right, you can move to the left. And now you have an equation that says that uh, the modified Einstein equation is equal to matter only. So this is a, exactly the same equation, uh, but the picture is different, that there's no dark energy, and in fact, modified, gravity is modified. Now, because these two equations are exactly equivalent, there's no way at all whatsoever with infinitely good measurements to distinguish between these two possibilities, right? They are mathematically equivalent. However, if you bring in cosmic growth, this is expansion history, if you bring cosmic growth, you can break the degeneracy. And intuitively speaking, it goes like this. This is a very simple version of the growth uh, of density fluctuations in lambda CDM on subhorizon scales, of course, no modified gravity, uh, all that. So this is a second uh, derivative. These are derivatives with time of the delta rho over rho. Now, I can imagine uh, measuring the expansion rate h very accurately, sticking it into this equation, whatever I measured, solving this equation, and finding uh, the growth that I predict. So I, I can find time evolution of uh, delta very accurately if I measure expansion in history accurately. That is to say, uh, in general relativity, Given measurements of expansion history, I get a very good prediction of growth. So then I can go and measure growth and see if I agree with those predictions that assume GR or do I not agree. So this intuitively, in practice, you wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be very practical to measure h of z, h of time. That's hard to do. And then stick it into an equation. You, you wouldn't do that in practice. But as a matter of principle, that is how this works, that you use combination of expansion history and growth history to break this degeneracy and to really learn a lot more than you would maybe naively guess. So this is fundamental reason why looking at growth history in some parameterization or with some descriptions uh, is a very, very good thing to do. Now, um, 
this is uh, one way to do this, an ambitious way to do this, is to separate explicitly between um, geometry and growth in the equations that govern cosmology. So for example, if I go back to this slide, this equation here is equation for expansion history, but maybe this equation is equation for growth history. And so if, where I can, if I consider a parameter like omega matter, I can do the following thing that was proposed years ago in a series of papers. Uh, I can measure omega matter geometry, uh, and that's a parameter I feed in geometry equations and omega matter growth, and I can see whether they agree, so they'd better be on the 45 degree line. And you can see here this plot from an older paper I wrote with a graduate student years ago, that the constraints, now you open up parameter space a lot. And now constraints from any given cosmological probe are quite weak. In fact, some of these plots are completely, you know, very weak constraints. But once you combine different probes, you break the degeneracy in high dimensional space. So you actually get fairly tight constraints. So you go from very, very large ellipses to something fairly small. And so, uh, the really nice thing about this is the diversity in the variety of cosmological probes, some of them are listed here, allows a great variety of how you can constrain geometry and growth. Simple cases include type 1 supernovae that are all geometry, or retrospace space distortions that are all growth. And then other probes, and again, those of you who work in cosmology recognize these things, uh, you know, weak lensing. Lensing is a famous example where you both geometry, there are geometrical factors in lensing, and there's growth factors, and both of them contribute. Now, if you think about this a little bit more, you will see that um, splitting into geometry and growth can be very hard. Some cases are very easy, like supernovae are all geometry, etc. But for example, if I ask you, what about the ISW effect? Is that geometry or growth? It's actually very hard to uh, answer that and in some cases there is no exact answer it's you, you cannot you know have a definitive answer but the really nice thing about this approach is that no matter what choice you make it's always a valid statistical test for example let's say i have omega matter geometry and omega matter growth but i made a mistake and in some place where it was supposed to geometry i put on growth or vice versa i still whatever however i made that uh, split I still have to end up with a 45 degree line. Let me give you an extreme example to convince you this is the case. Imagine all measurements taken on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I feed omega matter geometry. And all measurements in cosmology taken on Tuesday and Thursday, I feed omega matter growth. Well, that's a bit of a ridiculous thing to do, right? Why would you do that? But nevertheless, even if I do such a silly thing, I still expect that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, should agree within statistical errors with Tuesday, Thursday. So you can see that the exact choice doesn't matter for this to be a statistically valid test, which is why I'm a big fan of this growth and geometry split. Uh, and uh, other people have written papers on this. This is an incomplete list. And uh, I think more papers, especially photometric surveys like KIDS, HSC, and DES, are a very good game for this because they provide a variety of probes. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about this very much anymore. Uh, the, the one difficult, challenging thing with this test is you open up parameter space a lot. So if you split omega matter, that's one extra parameter. But if you split omega matter and W, you go from two dark energy parameters to these four dark energy parameters. And four dark energy parameters are challenging to constrain, even if you assume a flat universe. So you necessarily weaken your constraints once you open up to, to something like this parameterization. So instead of doing geometry and growth, which is a very thing, good, good thing to do, but not the main subject of this talk, we decided uh, to look at a, a, a parameter, a single parameter that's been proposed a long time ago. It's a, called the growth index gamma. Growth index has been introduced at least by Jim Peebles, and it goes by, back at least as far as 1980 in one of his cosmology textbooks. Peebles noticed that the growth rate, the linear growth rate, d log, linear growth, d log a, goes as omega matter a to the gamma. That's actually a very good fitting formula because people's found, and I think he first quoted 0 0.60, and nowadays we quote 0 0.55. So if you just take omega matter of a to the power of 0.55, as you vary omega matter in a flat universe, and even if you have dark energy, that's fine, you get a very good fit to the actual growth rate that you can obtain by integrating the growth equation directly. So that second order ODE that I showed, you can solve it directly, but this is a very convenient fitting formula. 
And the next step was made by the next uh, uh, step forward was made by Eric Linder, who much later noticed proposed that this gamma be promoted to a free parameter, a parameter that you can measure. Now you might ask, well, don't I get 0.55? Yes, you do. And in fact, in, in almost any GR model, you get 0.55 with a very small correction for equation of state at redshift of one, but basically, basically 0.55. However, if you have modified gravity, you get a different value of gamma. For example, in DGP gravity, gamma is 0.67. So by measuring gamma, you can, me you can very uh, easily um, test gravity and uh, you know, test the model. Now, there are some advantages and disadvantages to going to gamma. You can see it's much simpler than the geometry growth split. A great advantage that's very easy to implement. Now, let's not underestimate this implementation is a pain and can be a grand pain, but here it's about as easy as it gets. All you have to do is chase down the, the, growth, in, the growth rate or the growth, linear growth in your equations, and you need to code up this formula with a gamma as a free parameter. Uh, this advantage is it's not quote unquote physical. It's not physical, it's completely phenomenological. It's not a theory. But then again, lots of things that we do are not theory. Growth geometry split is obviously not theory. In fact, most you know, parameterizations that we use, or most, even when you do mu sigma modified gravity, which is a very popular way to test modified gravity, even that's not a theory. It doesn't predict nonlinear theory. So you know, unless it, it, it's really a steep climb to get real theory. So this is a disadvantage, but not a very big one, I would say. Uh, another advantage, again, is that it's very robust. So Gamma better be 0.55. And if it's not, something went wrong. Now, uh, hopefully you didn't make some mistake in your analysis, but it could be systematics or it could be a real departure from GR. But gamma has to come out 0.55, a concrete value. So that's also that cleanliness of this makes it uh, uh, appealing. So we've done this analysis. We are not the first paper by a long shot to constrain gamma, but we've done that using current data at the time, which is now one or two years ago. And this is work led by Min Wen, who is a postdoc who is currently just about to move from University of Michigan to IPMU. Uh, and uh, we got quite a lot of press coverage for this. There was a Scientific American article. There was other things where, you know, what, once we have this result. Uh, I'm going to explain it briefly and uh, say what uh, how it's going to be. The, the big picture is that this is going to be really updated with new data very soon. So this is based on data, pre-DESI data available a year or two ago. So we implemented the growth index to the theory pipeline. Um, CMB is affected by gamma only via lensing. I can say a few more words about implementation if people are interested. Um, one question that arises if you're implementing this is, what do you do about nonlinear power spectrum? Because remember, gamma is defined in linear theory, right? Gamma is defined in linear theory. Here's the linear growth. And this is derivative of linear growth. So this is defined linear theory. So we use the halo, we use the ansatz that in halo fit, uh, we use the halo fit formula with growth described by gamma. So that's a straightforward ansatz. Um, remember, gamma is not a model. So there's no true true answer. How do you, how, what's the truth, right? You can only have an ansatz. However, the powerful thing with, with this as, as was the, the case with growth geometry split is any way you implement gamma is, uh, you know, leads to a result. That is to say, if you find departure from gamma um, equal to 0.55, regardless of what you did for the implementation, the nonlinear power spectrum, something must have gone wrong. Because we verified that for gamma equal to 0.55 in the nonlinear uh, implementation, we recovered the usual results. So now the, I think the implementation makes sense. And, but if you question that, no matter how you implement it, you, if you're not ending up with gamma 0.55, that means something would have gone wrong. So that robustness with respect to uh, implementation is a big plus in my mind. Otherwise, you could have endless questions of, well, shouldn't you, what about another way to implement gamma? Uh, OK, so we apply that. And some of these probes are you know, fairly linear, like CMB. So we have CMB. Planck 2018, F sigma eight data. I'm going to show it in a moment. DES year one, 3.2 data. Um, DES year three is notoriously hard to get hand on in terms of likelihood. It certainly was a year or two ago. So we use DES year one data. 
and BAO data at the time. So this is a Sloan plus BAO data. The bottom line is once you we do analysis and we have two models, lambda CDM model and lambda CDM plus gamma, extended model with one extra parameter gamma. And remember 0.55 is the GR value. That's a standard model value. We find higher gamma than in the standard model by something like four sigma. And uh, that really fundamentally comes from two probes combined, F sigma eight, the data I'm gonna show in a moment, and Planck 2018. So Planck and F sigma eight data combined give you that. And then as you add other data, it actually goes down a bit, but it basically stays simple. So that's the basic thing. Now, let's just remember what high gamma means. And sorry, I'm gonna flip back here. High gamma means that you are raising omega matter to a larger number. Now, omega matter is a number less than one, omega matter of 80, right? That's a number less than one. So number less than one raised to a higher power gives you lower growth rate. So the data are favoring a lower growth rate. That's why we're talking about suppression of growth, right? So you have a number less than one to a higher number than the standard value gives you a lower value for the growth rate. So this is favoring suppression in the growth rate. And really the, the money plot that I think people would wanna see is really this one, because this shows you intuitively, at least for part of the data, this is not all of the data, F sigma A data, you can see compilation from retrospace distortion and peculiar, so peculiar velocity measurements are these black points here at redshift close to zero. These are peculiar velocity measurements from, um, I, I didn't have placed, but from the, the different surveys. Uh, and then here are the most righteous phase distortions measurements and narrow bars are kind of big because it's hard to see by eye, but it turns out that the data favor a red model. So the parameterization by construction affects dark energy, affects the growth rate at late times. Again, remember it's omega matter of A to the gamma. So, so I don't need to flip back again, I think, but if you think about high redshift, at high redshift omega matter is one. So you have omega matter A, so the gamma is one to the gamma, right? So it doesn't depend on, so the, the, the growth rate suppression, the, the gamma parameterization only by construction kicks in at low Z when omega matter of A is less than one, which is great. That's why we like gamma. It, it uh, allows variation in the growth when dark energy dominates. And so you know there's gonna be changes only in this regime. And in this regime, it's uh, suppressed data favored. Now, F sigma A data alone do not tell you that. So you, you shouldn't be trying to see by eye if these data points are uh, you know, uh, favoring the red curves over the blue black curve. But uh, Planck alone gives you higher gamma, but with a large error bar. But it's really when you combine Planck and F sigma eight, when you get 0.64 plus minus 0.25 or 0.025 or so. Uh, and you can see Hubble Conda, I'm gonna show. Uh, so you can see the delta chi squared, that jumps to minus, point thir minus 13. And for two degrees of freedom, this is very, uh, sorry, for one extra parameter. So there's only one extra parameter gamma. So for a single parameter, this is more than three sigma, right? Three sigma would be minus nine, four sigma would be minus 16. So this is how you get to, uh, to evidence for, um, um, uh, at least in terms of delta chi squared. Um, so gamma is higher. A couple of more results. So there's one more plot. Here's a few more possibilities. And so the dashed red is what I showed already. That's the fiducial case. And the solid purple is I showed already. And now you can see two more cases when you don't use Planck. So this is what where we got excited. We saw some robustness. Without Planck at all, we get some, not as strong, but some evidence for higher gamma without Planck and Lone. That's this dash blue line, and then without F sigma A data at all, this is the dash green line, we again, so we, we get again evidence for gamma greater than 0.55. So we have independent evidence, I don't know how many streams, but more than one stream of independent evidence from different data sets pointing in this direction based on the data a couple of years ago. Um, and then we get, when we got even more excited was these two plots. The plot on the right is showing these are residuals in the LL plus one CL. And you can see that gamma does a very similar thing as omega curvature in the ALS. All three of them do a very similar kind of thing, smoothing of the peaks. So A lens, right, higher A lens, uh, the amplitude of lensing smoothies the peaks in the CMB power spectrum. 
uh, and that's favored by Planck data at the time. And so best with curvature and so gamma does the same kind of thing. And this is kind of a nice plot. You can trade off gamma for omega curvature. So in the standard model, you are this horizontal line and at least uh, PR3 release of Planck data favored uh, omega K of negative something away from zero. But you can trade that, you can go, you can say, no, it's not omega curvature, it's actually gamma that's anomalous and curvature is zero. And then you are here somewhere. So this got us really excited because we had this independent, we had the additional evidence for this, another thing that really does the same thing as omega K is lens. I should also that add that between PR3 and PR4, so with a newer analysis, newer Planck likelihood, the evidence for curvature went down and so the, the excitement about this kind of plot would have gone down because as this goes down, you, you can't claim as much anymore that you're explaining the curvature, evidence for curvature because the evidence for curvature got a lot lower. So that, that changed. So the overall, we've looked at PR4, I don't remember the numbers. I have some plots if people care. The overall evidence for gamma went down a bit, stays, you know, results like this went down a bit. But, but this kind of plot is, I think, where it's not, not quite as compelling anymore with PR4. And we resolve the SA tension and alleviate the H0 tension. Um, I wouldn't say in a spectacular fashion, in a kind of expected fashion. So if you take a look at SA, these horizontal two arrow bars are previous. So ignore the vertical axis for the moment. Just SA in the standard model when gamma is 0.55, this is the lensing surveys give you a lower SA, and the Planck gives you a higher SA. Right. If you just fix gamma. Now, if you let gamma float, you go from these these horizontal arrow bars. You go to these contours. So, as you let gamma to vary, lensing uh, S8 goes up a bit, CMB S8 goes down a bit, and the arrow bars get broader because now you have your parameter. So, very easily do you resolve now the S8 tension. Not, not that there was a ton ton of tension to begin with. But if you thought there was tension, now that's completely gone, partly because of the error, increase of the error bar, but partly because the shift up and down in the desired direction. Um, H naught tension is alleviated, but again, also partly somewhat alleviated, not something we feature because the error bars on H naught get blown up a bit as you vary gamma. So just from that, you alleviate it. Uh, but the, another really interesting thing for fans of recent history of growth is in some of those same papers I mentioned in the paper with Ruiz and uh, Licha Verde and uh, Bernal and Cuesta had a paper on this as well. They found the same results. Uh, we found uh, years ago, so this is what I said, when you open up to the geometry growth parameters, you get very, very weak constraint from individual poses. This is a very tough cosmological uh, space to constrain because you have Omega matter growth, omega matter geometry, W growth, W geometry. So you're supposed to be on the 45 degree line in the standard model. And it's when you combine the data sets and you can see that RSD at the time, that was very important. RSD gives you just a horizontal contour. So this is just deconstrained, just growth. We got this contour that was, I forget, three point something sigma away from the 45 degree line. So we found W growth to be uh, unusually large. So W growth was not minus one. W was. Now, unless if you work with W a lot, it's hard to map out in your in your head what does W high mean. So just imagine going to the limit when W is not minus one, but W is zero. What happens in the universe with W of zero? Well, that's the universe in which dark energy is not 70% just today. Dark energy is 70% at all times in history of the universe, right? If W is zero, then dark energy scales like dark matter. So in that universe, there's not a single galaxy in the sky. So had we been a W of zero, there would be no, no structure at all. So that intuitively helps understand that moving to higher W toward the value from minus one toward zero suppresses growth. So higher W like here means suppressed growth. And that's exactly what higher gamma is. So qualitatively, this is in the same direction exactly. At that time, we found suppressed growth from the geometry growth split. And now, years later, we've seen suppressed growth from uh, uh, from the data. So, um, yep, new intriguing piece of evidence: the growth is of suppressed, uh, building upon previous work, which found the same. Now, arguably, 
not necessarily all the previous work I haven't taken census, but at least stuff I worked on, we saw the same thing with the geometry growth split. Um, this will be very sharply tested with new forthcoming data, especially the DESI year one full shape analysis, which is in progress, which is ongoing right now. The results won't be known for several months at least. Uh, there's some forecast we did some time ago in, with uh, Min and uh, UOA, but uh, that will definitely be a major update to this. I think um, as I conclude here with dark energy and dark matter 70%, 30%, Hubbleton tension being super excited because that might be a signature of new physics, this new evidence that we saw. I think the main takeaway that I had from this as we found this evidence was that maybe S8 is a harbinger of something, but S8 tension maybe isn't the best space in which to look at tension. Maybe it's really something like gamma where tension lives and only a fraction of it maps into S8, but it's really in sort of the gamma type space uh, that that you see what hopefully might be a uh, real tension um, relative to the standard cosmological model. That's all from me for the time being. I can take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the very nice talk. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Ada? Uh, hi, Dragon. Okay, great talk. Thank you. Um, so maybe I didn't quite catch at the end whether I understand there's more analysis to do with uh, DESI, but just simply, you know, replacing the BAO data set you used last year with the DESI first year data set. Um, do you have any sense whether the evidence for the growth suppression goes up, down, or is not affected? I don't know, but I suspect it's not affected very much because the main pieces that went into this were Planck and F sigma eight. And so F sigma eight, we don't yet have. So just doing the BAO was just the ne next, uh, the third wheel in this, you know, that we we tried. So I, I'm pretty sure that's not very much affected with BAO. Okay, thanks. But we haven't tried, we haven't tested that. Thank you. And Mustafa? Yeah, good talk, uh, Dragan. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, in the same way that when we changed from W and we went from W, that is a function of redshift, results have changed. So, my question is, there was a lot of work that has been done for gamma being a function of Z. And, um, and again, the test holds to distinguish between GR and other theories of gravity. So would you expect, or should we expect like some changes to these results if we allow for gamma to vary in time? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I actually have the answer for you. But before I do that, let me let me just back up and, and refer because not, in case not everyone followed. So Mustafa was referring to the fact that in the DESI year one BAO analysis, we found W constant. So we are just talking about W, dark energy equation state, with W constant to be consistent with minus one. But once we went to W zero WA, we found uh, very interesting evidence for non-zero WA. And we at least that part we understand intuitively uh, at the pivot point where W zero WA uh, are best constrained, W at that point is indeed close to minus one, but around Z of 0.5, there's actually a variation in W that's favored by the data. So, so adding this extra parameter really qualitatively changed the flavor of the results. Now the question was, what if we do the same with W gamma and go to gamma zero, gamma one? This parameterization isn't nearly as popular as either constant gamma or W version of the two. However, it just happens that with the same co-authors, Min uh, Wen and Yu Wei uh, Wen, we uh, wrote a paper on how much, you know, what are, what are the, how much is gamma, does gamma zero, gamma one do better job in explaining dark and explaining modified gravity theories than just constant gamma. But uh, along the route, we also constrained. We said, hey, we talked about this two parameter thing. Let's also constrain with data. And hopefully you can see this, uh, my screen, 
this is from the from this other paper led by U of A Ben. This is a constraint on gamma zero, gamma one. Now, uh, I pay less attention to this constraint than from the PRL paper where we spend a lot of time. But you can see, I think the essence is most of us questions. So if I constrain myself for gamma one is a variation, gamma one of zero, that's current work, you are here somewhere. And if you open up variation in gamma according to this prescription right here, then you get, then you still get departure at comparable level from the standard model. And you you don't favor gamma one decisively. So gamma one, you know, shifts up a bit, but really the main thing was the constant part of gamma that shift. So it, it just happens that we did that analysis as part of another paper. Okay, thanks. Hey, Dragon, thanks for the nice talk. Um, this is something you're familiar with. There's an anomaly in the late time integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, right? And what that does is between low redshifts and high redshifts, it interpolates through the Planck or Lambda CDM value, right? So this either would imply a suppression of growth at low redshift or an enhancement of growth at high redshift or something like that. But it has to go through the, the Lambda CDM expectation, right? And that should be connected to F sigma eight. So whatever you're seeing in growth, if that's not a completely isolated anomaly or a systematic, then we should see that growth actually varies with redshift. How would we fit that into a constant gamma is the question. I, I'm not familiar with the ISW anomaly, because this, which seems to be crucial in what you're saying. Uh, this is a DES paper. You're on DES, right? Um, this is the ISW from the super anomaly. voids. This was led oh, by... Oh, that thing. Um, oh, okay, okay. I Kovacs, see. Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I see that. Okay. It's so, from yeah, the sorry. Yeah, yes, uh, voids, yeah, um, as predicted of how much you would measure. Yeah, that's right. So you're, you're asking how what this, these results would affect it, basically? Like, if we, we should be able to translate that. If that result is physical, we should be able to translate that into a statement and growth. And the fact that at intermediate redshifts, it goes through plan, like a lambda CDM expectation, you know, A is equal to one, then it either means stronger or weaker growth at low redshifts versus high redshifts. So the growth has to be evolving relative to the plank. Yeah, I don't, I have no it's idea. It's not just a suppression answer. at low redshift. There yes, has you're to be right, you're right. That, the other side. So just to, to refer, and I have a half big memory, this is a while ago, the idea is to look at ISW effect in the directions of like known voids. And because right. those voids can be mapped out, maybe you can predict what that should be. And there was disagreement there which is uh, a lot of dirt, you know, it's a tricky analysis. Uh, and, but it is a fair question. Can you translate that literally to, to growth? And I think you should be able to, I have no idea what, what the answer is. Right. So in the follow-up paper that Kovacs writes from, I think 2021, that, that connection to growth is sort of spelled out and they do plot RSD constraints alongside whatever constraints they get from, you know, whatever analysis they're doing. And there seems to be a compelling picture that there's some evolution in growth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. There's just a comment. There's something. I don't think. disagree. It's just that 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 super void thing is is a very tricky thing to right. That, RSD uh, is much so much clearer. Desi this Rogan. is much. This all this stuff is much cleaner. But unclean things are good too. Just the uh, you know the pinch of caution when when but yes uh that that's also interesting to investigate and Kovac did some 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 something along those lines okay okay thanks any other questions well i see one in the chat as i'm hanging uh the question is uh, whether this can be re reformulated in terms of s12 as opposed to s8 the answer is no <laughs> That is to say, I don't think I don't think S12 uh, quoting over density at 12 megaparsecs as opposed to H8 H inverse megaparsecs. I don't think um, I think that's just shifting the generosity direction. The, the ink has been spilled on this on the archive previously, but I don't think that does. I think that just shifts attention. So actually, you're right that that might shift you. That'll change your S8 tension will not be the same as the S12 tension. Kind of obviously, 
Uh, but the overall tension, if you think about the global parameter space, should be unchanged because this is just kind of reparameterizing. So I don't find it fruitful to go look at S12 personally. Um, yeah, that, that might be my take on, on this question. On that. So let's thank Dragon again. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Pleasure.